A stitch in time saves nine. That was one of those cliches that I heard growing up, but I had no idea what it meant. When I first heard it, I, I think it was my grandmother said it about something and said, well, a stitch in time saves nine. And I was like, nine what? Nine people? Nine... I don't know. I don't know. For whatever reason, it, it just didn't make any sense to me the first time I heard it. And as an adult, I finally figured out what it meant. And I actually then every once in a while will say it in a certain uh, context. And it's a stitch in time saves nine stitches. Right. I mean, it's a sewing analogy. Again, I, had, I didn't know anything about s sewing. So I was like a stitch. And it. it you know, for me, it almost sounded like a time travel thought, you know, that a, a wrinkle in time or something. I just, I didn't get it as a kid. I just didn't have the context to understand it. But if you fix a tear in a piece of fabric when it's small, right, it will only take one stitch to fix. But if you ignore the problem and kind of hope uh, it'll, it'll fix itself, you may find yourself sewing a total of 10 stitches for what could have been fixed a little easier. And earlier, and so a stitch in time saves nine. It's just one of those things that the simplicity of it, once you really understand it, you go, ah, you know, it's one of those, um, you know, measure twice, cut once kind of cliches. And you go, well, why are they cliches? You go, well, part of the reason is they're so true over time that you just say, this, this has been the human experience. People have found this to be true, that timely action, early intervention is an important part of our life, and we have to have an honest evaluation of our own life to be able to do that, to, to be able to recognize a rip, whatever it might be, and repair it before it gets completely out of control. And today we're going to talk not about fabric, but on faith, and I titled today's talk, Time Will Tell. Time will tell. That's another just one of those, well, time will tell. Time will tell. You know, and people will say, well, do you think this is a good idea? Well, time will tell. And you go, what does that mean anyway? What will time tell? Well, what time will tell is whether the inputs that I put in will lead to the output or outcome that I was hoping for, right? Well, time will tell. There's times where you think, was this a good idea? I'm not sure. I don't know. Or will that person keep getting away with that bad action? Well, time will tell. And so whether our lives or those around us will need one stitch or ten to fix some of the problems, uh, a medical procedure would think of it that way. You know, was it successful? Well, time will tell, right? They'll do something, and, and I've had medical procedures where they sewed it up, right? And I asked the doc, well, is that it? Are we done? He said, well, time will tell. Your next visit will tell me an awful lot about what's going on. And I've asked you to do certain things between now and then uh, that will partially determine that as well. And uh, just last time I was at the dermatologist, I got a great report. But one of the things he said is we don't want you growing any more of those things that you grew that caused us to have to cut it all the way out, right? If, I, if we can early intervene and we can stay in front of these things, then guess what? You can have uh, fewer of those big stitch problems. And I'm like, okay, I get that, right? And so a counseling session could say, hey, was there a correction in the direction? Well, I don't know. Time will tell. The advice was given. I don't know if the advice was followed, you know, whether it was taken. Time will tell whether that was an hour well spent or an hour and money wasted. So you think about investment decisions. Was it a good one? I don't know. Will it go up? Will it go down? Time will tell. There are certain things that almost anyone can predict backwards, right? It's, it's very easy to see who would win last year's Super Bowl or what, you know, what, what might happen at the end of a movie you've already seen. And so one phrase that's a part of every parent's repertoire, right? My parents passed it on to me and now I pass it on to my kids, which is how many times do I have to tell you? Um, that's, a, that's a rhetorical question. How many times do I have to tell you? I was a very sarcastic kid, so I would tell my mom, I guess one more, uh, because I, st <laughs> you know, I still didn't get it. You know, and I, I to, no, I, but seriously, mom, I guess one more. I know I'm, I'm slow to learn. I, I know you told me you told me 10 times and I guess 11 might be the time. And so time will tell, but sometimes we have to tell something many times before someone gets it. And there's some things, you know, in life that we'll miss. Some things are truly only figured out over time. That 
I would love to think that every kid that I've told anything in a class learned it the easy way in the first time. I said it once. Isn't that enough? I, I mentioned a cliche and everyone nodded their head and said, oh, I guess we know what that means. But again, I heard Stitch in Time saves nine and I didn't think to raise my hand and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. I just kind of said, okay, well, whatever. I don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. So there's many times in life where you say, well, the first time I don't get it. The second time I still don't get it. The third time, oh, ho, 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 I think I'm starting to get it. And so again, time will tell. I've been a parent for 23 years at this point. I've been a pastor for 20 of those years. And if there's one thing that I've learned over time, it's that time will tell. That the true outcome of most things can't really be discerned exactly in the moment, the value of them, or whether or not someone got it or not. Uh, the times where you'd you know, maybe spend six weeks talking with somebody about something and they went and did exactly what they were going to do anyway. And you said, well, you know, time will tell whether they listened or they didn't, whether there was any value in that. I think about how many marriage ceremonies I did. And there was a, a, a couple that to this day, they're amazing people and they're, they're wonderfully married and have great kids and everything. Um, but we went through the premarital council with them. I did. And I remember him telling me, I don't get it. Most of the stuff you're saying, I, I don't get it. But he said, somehow I had that notebook and I, I got it later. I went, I thought, wait a minute. Let's, I think I already heard this once, but I didn't get it the first time. So, you know, will, will a marriage last? Will it go well? Time will tell. I mean, there were people who predicted Lynn and I, the over under on our uh, graduate school mid year marriage in the, in the summer in between two years of grad school, the over under was we wouldn't make it to graduation. All right. That was, that was basically the running bet. Well, time will tell, you know, will we make it? Time will tell. But so far, you look at those things and say what might have seemed likely or unlikely at one point can go very different. And so I think about it this way, truth. Truth is one of those things that's not just one and done. Uh, someone can hear a truth and go, well, I think that's true. But until somebody has done it and done it and done it and in a long direction of obedience actually seen that that truth does pan out, a lot of times only time will tell the difference between good decisions and bad decisions. Because you know what? Here's a, here's a frustrating truth of life sometimes, which is good decisions can lead to difficult outcomes. And bad decisions can be easy in the short run. So only time will tell. People will say, hey, I'm doing it wrong and I'm getting it right. And you go, yeah, well, time will tell whether that's a good strategy or not. See, truth is not I said it once, they saw it once, that's the end of the story. It's not that way, is it? It's, it's that it takes time to be truly revealed, to actually grow, to show what it really is, for good or for bad. And again, something can go along fine for a while, and people think they get away with that. But if it's bad, time will tell. Time will tell. It has just a way of doing that. And if something's good, it could go unrewarded for a while, maybe even a long time. But you know what? I've seen, again, over time, time will tell, time will tell. And if God has said something's true, it might not look true the first time I try it. It might not look true for the first few years, but in time, in time, it will come to light. And so a stitch in time does save nine. And the stitch I want you to think about today is just truth. Truth itself is a stitch. It holds together things that would tend to fly apart. Right? Things that would be torn and destroyed and, and, and wrecked. Well, truth can bring those things back together. But truth is also like a scalpel sometimes. It can actually cut before the stitch. And so when you think about that, I've been alive long enough to know that we often want to address spiritual issues in kind of superficial ways. Right? I like that. I like easy Band-Aids. Right? I like Band-Aids on big problems uh, because... Hey, a band-aid's pretty easy. We deny, we avoid, we ignore, we excuse. There's no problem here. You know, I'm fine, really. You know, that just something is tearing apart. And you go, you know what? 2 Corinthians 13 is Paul as a as a spiritual surgeon, so to speak, telling some tough truths. And he's he's kind of telling them, hey, at the end of this letter, time's just about up. Time's about to tell. Whether there's been a lot of nice things 
exchanged in letters, whether there's been promises made, you know, oh, yeah, things are a lot better, you know, and that sort of stuff. But were they better? Are they better? And it's a stern wa- warning in this, in this letter, almost a threat, you know, and you think about that and you say, well, why would Paul do that? Well, the reason is he knew and he loved in such a way that he knew that if I just kind of like cover over this, it's really going to bubble back. See, if you don't, if you can resolve a lot of times things with one stitch, but you can't fix everything with one stitch if it's been allowed to become, you know, so much more than that. See, the interesting thing here not to miss is that Paul was patient with his patience. I like that. He was, he had a great bedside manner, so to speak, spiritually speaking. Again, he was a guy who considered himself certainly not a know-it-all because God was working on him. Did you see that all throughout this letter? I mean, Paul is a patient also. And I'm happening to I'm happen to be reading a book right now that is an absolutely must read, I would say, for you. Everyone said that to me and I'm not done with it yet, but it's an incredible book and it's called When Breath Becomes Air. And it's the story of an amazing neurosurgeon who himself contracts inoperable cancer and he the things that he goes through in that process. And let me tell you, it is un. Believable. This book has affected me already dramatically and probably will continue to do so. But the thing to remember is that Paul was both a skilled surgeon and a sinner like all the rest. So here he is, you know, in all of this stuff. He's God's working on Paul and Paul's working on people, and it's just quite an interesting thing. And he didn't rush and rip everything apart. You know, Paul wasn't a guy to just go in slashing with the knife and all the rest. He put spiritual stitches in, only as many as needed, with as little invasion as possible. He tried to do minimal, minimally invasive moves. I, I love that about him. If you really look at him as a, as a leader, he's an amazing example. He, he would avoid extreme surgeries, but he was not afraid of taking tumors out, right? I mean, so this is a guy who would go into the most complex situations and try to do the least that was required. But you know what? There were times when things can get to the point where even the most skilled surgeon will say, this is rapidly becoming inoperable. If we don't deal with it now, it will deal with it. I mean, it's just it's going to happen. And one of the things I've found over time is just that gravity won't be denied forever, right? Sometimes you watch a sports star and you see them do this amazing move and they go, they just seem to defy gravity as they do, you know, a a dunk from from the free throw line. But then gravity wins. Gravity wins. It just eventually wins. I mean, they don't just keep flying out into the parking lot, right? I mean, gravity wins. Even the most amazing of people have to deal with truth. Truth will win. Truth does win out. Time will tell. Nobody can live a lie without truth telling the truth. They will tell the truth in time. So somebody can deny and say, I don't have an illness. But the illness will say, not true. And so no matter what somebody does, you know, age has a way of, well, you can lie about your age, but time will tell. You know, it'll tell on you. And so here we have this chapter about honest self-evaluation. I think it's a great thing, taking spiritual inventory. Might as well, because time will tell anyway. So I might as well take some spiritual inventory myself, right? Because maybe I can deal with something on one stitch before it's too late. Um, You know what audits are, right? I mean, the idea of an audit is that you would self-audit before you get audited from the outside, right? Which is that if I make small adjustments, I won't have to make the big adjustment. And, you know, I think about this. One of Lynn's uh, things right out of school, she had one of the most difficult jobs I could ever imagine, which is uh, she was a Blockbuster video store manager. Uh, This was before Netflix, this Blockbuster video. You would go to a store and you would get a VHS tape and you would have it for a few days and all this kind of stuff. But um, inventory, inventory, having to do inventory. I remember inventory night when it would come and Len shaking her head even now. It's a very traumatic thought. But every piece of candy in that place, every bag of microwave popcorn, every promotional item in the store had to be scanned. Every video had to be scanned through the system to say, 
is, is the store actually got what it says it has, you know, versus uh, just loaning out videos, renting them, pocketing the money and all that stuff. Well, how do you keep some big scandal from happening? Inventory. Inventory. And it was all night. It was counting and comparison to see with, if what they said was on the shelf was really on the shelf. If you can't relate to that, maybe you can think about, you know, uh, dentists. Dentists, you go in for this routine checkups, right? Annual physicals, that type of stuff. And, you know, it's not really that pleasant a process. But what is it? The attempt is to early intervene and get things taken care of before they get worse, right? So you get the dreaded question, are you flossing regularly? Uh, and you're like, was that a yes? And you go, well, doctor somehow, dentist can understand all that. But the answer was, yes, I'm flossing, which means I was flossing the week prior to the inspection, right? Um, but when I think about that, our cars, preventive maintenance, whatever it might be, there's always areas of life where, you know, there was that old ad that said, pay me now or pay me later. That was the Midas ad. And it was basically preventive maintenance or corrective maintenance. And preventive maintenance is painful because you, you don't have to do it. It's kind of like, well, you could replace this now. And if you do that, it will only cost $100. And you're like, $100, so I don't have to do it now? No, you don't have to do it now. But if you don't do it now, it'll probably cost $500 next time you're here. And you're like, eh, a lot could happen between now and then. I just won't do it. And so this is another thing I wrote down for today. An ounce of prevention's worth a pound of cure. Remember that one? Ounce of prevention, pound of cure. Um, and so when you think about it, taking inventory, that's what we're doing now. Routine spiritual exam. So let me get a running start to this last chapter because I'm going to start back in chapter 12, verse 20 and 21, just so you see where Paul's coming from. He says, for I fear lest when I come, this is verse 20 from chapter 12, I shall not find you such as I wish and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. <laughs> Let there, lest there be contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions and backbitings and whisperings and conceits and tumults, lest when I come again my God will humble me among you and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and haven't repented of the uncleanness, fornication, lewdness which they have practiced. What is Paul basically saying? He's basically saying... Uh, how many times do I have to tell you? I mean, how many times did I tell you? And of course, the answer was, well, one more, I guess, right? Just like it was for me when I was young. One more. How many times did Paul need to say these things? Well, the mixed response to Paul's prior letters and visits suggests that, that he really couldn't over-communicate the idea that there's an easy way and a hard way in life. And some changed because of his words, the easy way. He said, listen, these things are not good. They're not going to lead to the path you want, right? And some would come in and, and deny and challenge and lie and cover and all the rest. And they would basically, you know, turn the tables back at him and say, well, Paul, you know, who are you to tell us this? You're not perfect either, right? And so he would repeatedly say, I know I'm not. I am subject to the same, you know, exam that you are. I got to go in for the same test and time will tell whether I'm telling just truths but not living them, preaching them but not practicing them. He says, man, it's humbling. It's embarrassing to have to say things to adults that you never thought you would have to say to an adult. I mean, it's very embarrassing because you realize, hey, who am I to tell you this? I am nobody. But I can tell you that if nobody tells you this and you don't get it, it's going to be very ugly. And so very fascinating to me that the biggest issue causing problems in Corinth wasn't the heathen environment around them, although that was obviously a constant temptation and pressure. The biggest deal, the biggest deal was that there were people there who, while God is giving grace, there were people, that, people there who were giving out law, law by the ton. They were basically giving rules and rules and rules. It was the same thing that happened while Jesus was here. You had the Pharisees who were stacking on policies and rules and regulations that they themselves didn't even submit to, but they wanted everyone else to, and they would judge everyone else by that same ridiculous standard. And here's what's interesting about it. They would talk truth, but they wouldn't walk the truth. They talked. So they talked big, 
but they walked small, right? They appeared outwardly holy, but God knew better. He, he looked under the hood, right? And he says, this isn't all good. And it's interesting that for all their legalism, they would, they would come against Paul for all these ways that he wasn't living up to the outward standard and he didn't look cool enough to be a leader and things like that. I mean, that's really what they were coming out with. And in spite of all of these false teachers who would lay a heavy burden on people, they still weren't living a holy life. I mean, it's really amazing to me. And so religiosity produces hypocrites. And the first hypocrites it, it produces are the ones preaching it, right? Because if you preach law, you don't yourself live up to the standard there. But if you preach grace, you say, here's the standard. I also am being examined by that same microscope. And God is trying to fix my life with one stitch instead of 10. My life needs the same truth as anybody else's. But you know, when somebody starts thinking, well, I have the truth and you need it, and I'll you know, talk it down to you, but they don't live it. And that is the recipe for disaster. And you've seen that in the news. You know what I'm talking about. Religiosity produces actors. And here's the thing about actors, time will tell. Did you know you can only act so long? You know, if I hold my breath in for a picture, as soon as the picture's over, ah, time tells. You'll get a picture where I didn't know it was a candid. And you go, wow, th th you were fat in that picture. And you're like, no, I'm fat in every picture. It's just I'm <gasps> holding it for 10 seconds. <laughs> but you know, someone, something will surface if somebody lives as an actor. And so they were acting like they were more important than Paul because Paul didn't act he just said this is this is my real life but this is reality and unless we submit to the same thing we'll all end up in the same disaster so Paul gives grace and they because of that find fault with Paul isn't that funny and so humility is the path to holiness and that brings us to this concluding chapter, and this is what Paul says. But grace is not grease, and you've heard me say that before, but it means it's not just a slippery, slimy substance that has no traction of truth. Grace has truth in it. And so you see this in verse 1. It says, this will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. This was a very important thing that he was doing. He was making it clear that he took his time to tell the truth, that he wasn't just rushing in, quickly assessing something without listening, had no idea what he was talking about, and just pronouncing a judgment that was unfair. See, this was an important part of their cultural law, and you may know that. Deuteronomy 19.15 said, one witness isn't enough, right? It's not my word versus your word. It is when, when you have witnesses all saying the same thing, after a while, you start to think, well, you know what? There's one liar and 15 people telling the truth. That's part of the reason we have juries. It's one of the reasons we have the idea of multiple witnesses. We don't just say, well, he says he saw this, so you're guilty and you're gone. Now, of course, in today's society, sometimes it's you know, all it takes is one, one accusation and you're guilty, right? So, I mean, there's the, the, that's the danger with that, right? So Paul did things very scripturally, and he's basically saying, now, I'm, I'm coming for the third time. Remember, it takes three, three strikes and you're out, but I, I, I'm not just calling you out on the first strike. I, I'm doing what, what I preach, which is I'm, I took time to look at this. I, I, I've thought it over I've, I've molded over and he wasn't one jumping to judgmental conclusions all the time he waited I remember what I said he was patient with his patience and so if you have any areas where you are in some degree of authority and you have to make some decisions because that's part of what leadership is it comes in a lot of different formats he would warn he would encourage he would even beg there's times where he says I'm imploring you come on I, how many times do I have to tell you but there came a a time when he says time's about to tell and I'm about to tell it as unfiltered as I know how to do so Paul's preference was resolving issues when they were small right to do it gently to do it with one stitch right the one stitch one stitch no scar nobody knows half the people didn't even know anything happened right but there comes a point where if someone doesn't resolve something privately it, it, it resolves itself publicly we've seen this so many times hopefully from afar, but sometimes it can get very close. 
The Judaizers had accused Paul of being a weak man over and over again. He's so weak. He's so weak. He's always, he's sewing. He's always over there sewing things up, patching things up, glossing things over, putting a little Band-Aid on it, things like that. And he says, you know what? I know how to do organ transplants if I need to. <laughs> if we have to do something serious, I'll do it. And verse 2, he says, I've told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I won't spare. What's he saying? The third time won't be the charm. Okay, <laughs> it won't. He says, time will tell. I've told you many times. I've told you time and time again. And I'm about to tell you a, a way that maybe is the only way you understand. And so when you think about this, not spare, it was actually the military term for take no prisoners. Like if you said, okay, we're going to take over this town, but we'll spare. Um, you know, if, if they surrender, uh, we, we, but he said, a take no prisoners charge was we're burning it to the ground. There's, it's too late. It's too all of the negotiations and all of the silliness where as soon as you get ready to do something, they say, no, 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 I'm sorry. He says, that's all over. It's done. He says, I, I, by this point, there will be no debate. There will be no discussion. I'm simply going to dispense of those <laughs> who have been the problem. And again, this isn't me saying this. This is Paul saying that. As an apostle, why did this matter so much? Do you realize that if this had died in his day, we would die in our day? That, that there were implications far beyond what was happening in Corinth to what was happening in Corinth? That if there had not been a seriousness taken to these things, these truths would not have been preserved to our day. And so I think about it, Paul's demonstrating the character of God here to the Corinthians, which is time will tell, time will tell. But one of the things time will tell is God is very slow to judge, but he is till he isn't, right? I think that's a really important thought. He is till he is not. God is slow to judge until God is not slow to judge, right? And judgment comes swiftly when it finally does come. And this is the pattern of human history. If you really pay any attention to it, it's repeated warnings. This is going to happen. If you don't change, this is going to happen. I don't want it to happen, but it's going to happen if you don't change. And then if people don't, what happens? What was said would happen. The results come. Time will tell the truth. And anyone who mistakes God's grace for the indifference has missed this truth. The choices have consequences. They always have. They always will. Gravity always wins. And so, you know, there's a, depravity has a gravity, right? It drags things down. And so it can, for a time, escape this law. Oh, you can run from the law, but you can't run from the law of gravity and you can't run from the law of sin and death. That's what Paul's basically saying. There's a law, there's a choice, there's a consequence, and directions have destinations, and time will tell. And God tells us many, many times, but there's a last time God will tell. You know, there's a time where it's like, that's it, I will not spare. This is not the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament, you know, the good, the, the really nice Jesus God of the New Testament who's always talking about nice stuff and the Old Testament God of wrath and all that. There's one God. But what you see is that Jesus gave time and time and time again. He would tell something and he'd say, I'm going to give you some time to think about that. There's, there's some intervening time until the actual consequence of the choice comes. And that time is supposed to be God the surgeon being patient with his patients, right? Saying, hey, you know, there's two things we could do. We could wait and stitch it up with 10 stitches, or we could do it now and stitch it up with one, or you could wait forever and it becomes inoperable and it's, it, and it's just simply too late for even God to do something about that. That's consistent with his character. See, Moses asked God, what is your character? Show me your nature. That was Exodus 34. I said it came out of the song, uh, 10,000 Reasons. But it's actually funny because it's God telling Moses, this is what I'm like. You want to know what I'm like? This is what I'm like. So this isn't Moses telling us what God is like. This is God telling Moses what God is like. He says, the Lord, it says, the Lord passed before him and said, Talking about himself. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And you go, 
A lot of people would love it to stop right there, but it doesn't. It says, but by no means clearing the guilty. It's like, see, he, he's, he's patient till he isn't. He's, he spares until he doesn't, right? And as a parent, you know, one of the things that is true, I think, you know, there, there's always a spectrum that people have and everyone's got to muddle their way through it. You know, no two kids are the same. No two parents are the same. But I think there's some principles that are true, which is you should never punish without warning and you should never warn without punishing. Right? You should never punish without warning. Kids just walking along, doesn't know it's even wrong. Smack! You know, and you're like, well, what was that? inconsistent, crazy behavior that no one can really understand or respond in any way to. God is not like that in any way. But also there's people who say, if you keep doing that, you're going to lose your phone for a week. And they don't. And nothing ever happens. And none of the things are ever followed through with. And we know that both of those create monsters, don't they? Somebody who gets punished without warning, randomly with no reason or rhyme to it, that creates a really difficult situation mentally for a kid and emotionally. But a kid who never, ever, ever has a consequence to their choice and hears endless, this will happen if you keep doing that and it never does, that doesn't work either. And so when I think about it, God's nature is so revealed in this. He, he is, his go-to move is not punishment. God is not big on, oh man, I can't wait to get him in trouble for this. What it is is a realization that sin kills and left to its inevitable end, that it will be the end and it will not only kill the host, but it'll kill anyone within any distance of that. So Paul says, man, I've warned, I've waited, I've given you chances to change and I have given warnings. But don't think they're empty warnings any more than God's are. If they're in open uh, rebellion, there'll be consequences. And he takes inventory of himself. He, I love that about Paul because he says, if I judge myself, I don't have to be judged. If I would be somebody to, to go into the doctor and say, you know, this, I, I, I need to deal with this. I don't have to wait for the thing to press the issue, right? And so it's the old one stitch or tin question. And so Paul says, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who's not weak toward you, but mighty in you. Verse four, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we're weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. I think this is such an important thing because it, it actually, on some level, at least it's been my attempt, it has defined every role I've, I've taken of any form of leadership, which is sometimes there are people who think it's a weakness. And people looking at the face of it could have said, Jesus was weak. What a weakling. A bunch of people took him to the cross and nailed him to the cross. I mean, and, and there's so many times when, Paul, uh, you know, when Jesus even said, right now, I could call down legions of angels and wipe this whole thing out. I mean, it, you know, there were things that he had that he did not avail himself of. And Paul, over and over, was like that. You know, you don't always go for the sledgehammer, right? There are people who think leadership is who's got the most power and who can shove everyone else down. But I think about it as who is the person who has the power under the most control? Who, who is a person who is able to maybe fix something with the least amount of pressure? So, you know, I, it's not the doctor who can come in and again, split the skulls and ah, you know, all that stuff. You go, I like the guy who says, we can do this with a scar you won't even be able to find. And you're like, that's amazing. That's power, that's ability. And so when I think about that, it's at least been my goal to learn from God that you don't always have to go in as the wrecking ball. Sometimes you're going as the reconciliation one. And Jesus had to pay a tremendous price for that. And Paul did too. But one of the, one of the prices Paul had to pay is that guys who led through power and strength would look over at him and say, he's a weakling. I don't know why you follow him or listen to him. And they would tell people what to do and people would do it. And Paul would beg people to follow the truth and they didn't. And you think about that and you go, hmm, Jesus did the same thing. He let people walk away from truth. He didn't shackle them to the truth. He didn't force them. He didn't do all that. He said, here's the truth and time will tell. 
There's a great parable where he says, there was a guy who said, I will do all that you have said and didn't do it. And there was a guy who said, I ain't doing that. And then he later went out and did it. And he said, which was the one who was the obedient son? And it's like the one who said they would or the one who did. And I love that because he was saying, time will tell. There were times where he told parables where he said, uh, you guys are going to go in and start ripping up weeds and, uh, you know, deciding this person's good, that person's good, this person's false, this person's true. He said, don't do that. Let it grow till the end of the age. And he says, at that time, time will tell. Time will tell whether somebody lived well or not well, whether their motives were right or wrong. And I think about this, and it, it is one of the most difficult things in life is to see something that you want to bring a wrecking ball to, and God says, we're going to wait one more season for that. Ah, you know, did, did you know it actually is what bothered Jonah? Did you, have you, you know that story of Jonah that bears his name? But some people miss the whole thing that's interesting about that, which is the reason he ran, some people think he was scared of the mission. Uh, if you read closer, you'll see he was scared that God would forgive them, that he would be successful. Now you go, what kind of weird thought is that? He didn't like the Ninevites. He hated them. He had a personal vendetta against them. And he says, I know what you're like, God. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to tell them, unless you repent, Judgment is coming, and they're going to repent. And judgment isn't going to come, and everyone's going to laugh at me and say, oh, you're always carrying the sign that the end's going to come, and it never comes, and look. And he says, "And I, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. I know I will have to pay a price, and other people will get the benefit, and I'm, I'm not going to do it. That's the real message of Jonah. It's a funny story that Jonah had less compassion on people than God did. Jonah's patience ran out, so he ran the opposite way. And God was working in Jonah as well as the Ninevites. He was trying to bring the Father's heart to Jonah, which is often God's hardest thing, is to get the people closest to him to actually understand what he's about. So time will tell. What did time tell? Well, the last chapters, we saw it. What happened in Paul's life? When, after he wrote this difficult letter, and told him, hey, I love you. What, what went through? He, he said, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is, you know, people are telling you they love you, but he defines love. And 1 Corinthians 13 is probably the most famous of all Bible passages. It gets read at weddings all the time, right? One letter back. But he's doing that. And what happened between 1 Corinthians 13 and 2 Corinthians 13? Well, he went through shipwrecks and prison and beatings and he kept coming back to say, I still got to bring you truth because time told why Paul was doing what Paul was doing. Why was he doing it? Why were the false teachers doing it? Well, they were doing it for the money or the fame or the power, the prestige, the ease, the comfort, all these things. And as soon as those things were gone, so were they. And who stuck with it with them? Paul, through thick and thin. And so I love this because he's saying, look, if you look at my life, you'll see the same thing that I learned from Jesus. I got it from him, which is that weakness reveals strength like nothing else. Strength often just reveals weakness. You know, the big bully who's got to act big. But the truth is they're more insecure than everyone else. And he says security allows you to look like a fool. See, if I need my kid's approval man, I'm going to do some really dumb things. One of the things we do is, as over at the school is we make sure parents, uh, teachers don't need students to like them. Like if, if you're interviewing with a teacher and they're just, I just want kids to all love me, you're like, uh-oh, you're not going to make a very good teacher because they're not going to all love you. Some of the things you're going to do, they're not going to love, right? So we want them to learn from you. We want you to love them, but we're not sure if we want them to all love you. You, don't, you need to not be needy, okay? If you're needy of that approval, it's going to be very, very difficult. And so using that standard, Paul was like, hey, I love you, but I don't need you to love me back. I really don't. I'm just going to do the right thing. The character of Christ, he's taking this spiritual inventory, right? Jesus loved those who did not love him back, but he didn't need their love to love them back. Verse 5, he says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. This is an interesting thing because Paul, again, is assuming them to be believers, but he doesn't want to assume them to be believers. He doesn't want them to assume it because it's a very dangerous assumption. So he's like, look, I'm not doubting your faith. 
unless I should doubt your faith, right? I'm, I'm, I'm saying, hey, you're in the faith. You have Christ in you, unless you don't, which you should do that test. Notice he doesn't say, I'm going to examine each and every one of you. He says, examine yourself. Test yourself. Why? Because time will tell. See, again, people can claim all kinds of things in life. I, I know people who've made incredible professions of faith, and one of the things that I, over time I've been criticized for, actually, is not celebrating enough when people get, quote, saved. Um, that I didn't rejoice enough because the angels are rejoicing all over the place and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I get it, man. I'm very enthusiastic about this situation. However, time will tell. You go, what, what's the matter with you? Uh, time will tell. See, I've seen far too many people that had amazing professions of faith until they didn't. And then you went, well, uh, see, Paul talks about it here and. Disqualified is an interesting word. Disqualified. There's times in the, in the uh, language there of the New Testament that it's used to refer to someone who is not a believer. Okay, that word is sometimes used contextually very obvious. They're not a believer. But there's other times where that same word is used to refer to a believer who loses their effectiveness. Someone who's in a backslidden spiritual state. And see, the reason I think there's sometimes ambiguity on these things is there's supposed to be ambiguity on these things. I live by a principle, which is I try never to inject uncertainty where there should be certainty. But I also try never to bring certainty to an area there should be uncertainty. See, think about Paul here. He did, oh, you're okay. All of you are, all dogs go to heaven. Don't you worry. You know, oh, you checked a box somewhere. You're good. You're good. He didn't do that. He said, you know what? Test yourself. I'm not, who am I to test you? But I'm definitely a guy who would say, you ought to go home and test yourself on this one. Test yourself because the test results will matter to you, not to me. I got to test me. My test results matter. But I should tell a person, you might want to know if there's a reality or not to your spiritual life. Because someone in a backslidden spiritual state looks identical to me. I don't, what do I know? I don't know whether you're having a, a bad three years in the middle of an amazing life of faith. I don't know that. So I'm not going to say anything about that. But time will tell. Directions have destinies. You know, there were people who Paul was saying, you know, disqualified. Maybe you're disqualified from this race, but you're not out of the grace race altogether. But you know what? There's a time where if you get disqualified from everything, I don't even know what to say about that. Paul was saying, I don't want to preach to others and then be disqualified. That was 1 Corinthians 9.27. And again, I look at 1 Corinthians 9.27 and I say, well, Paul, if he had a bad ending, that doesn't mean that he didn't believe it meant that he was rendered ineffective so again the test he's asking his first test is christ in you that's the believer test is jesus in you well that's either yes or no he either is or he isn't but there's further tests right is he is he growing in you or is he shrinking in you right is he is he being lived out through you these are really important ones too so again i believe completely in the security of believers but i also believe in the insecurity of make believers i think the bible teaches us to do that you know and so Nicodemus he was a guy who was probably pretty confident in his faith came to Jesus very he thought the test was do you know all the scriptural answers to everything and Jesus said um yours there's a problem you need to be born again <laughs> you need to have the spiritual birth take place in your life. You haven't even done that. You've grown a lot intellectually, but you haven't grown spiritually at all because you haven't even done the first step. Colossians 1.27 tells us one of the most important verses, I think, in the entire Bible. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I'm like, he either is or he isn't, right? But there's all types of maturity that people exhibit, and you know we have good days and bad days. So there's a lot to look at in testing. But the first test would be, you know, I think step one, you know, is Christ in you? And is he being formed in you? Are you abiding in him? And the thing is, I think it's really easy to look at other people's tests. I mean, it just really is. It's like, well, what did they get? Well, who cares what they got? Well, I want to know how good I am compared to them. You go, it's not graded on a curve. The question is, Paul's saying, test yourself before I come. 
And you know what? We could have a great meeting. He could show up in Corinth and there's still nothing to do because they already tested themselves. And if they found that they fell short, they would fix that. And Paul wouldn't have to come do anything because it had already been stitched. And see, one of the things I think about it real quickly is in my life, um, I wear glasses, right? And I didn't always wear glasses, but there was a time where I needed to wear glasses and I didn't. Um, but I thought the world was messing up, right? The whole world was getting fuzzy. There were lots of problems in the world. And then I actually got tested and I went, oh my, it's me, uh, right? And there's still times to this day where like it, I'll, I'll you know, smudge my glasses or something and I think, what a dreary day. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> actually it's nice and sunny. It's my glasses, right? <laughs> so I think there's times where the way we see everything can be greatly colored by what's going on in our life. And this is where Paul, I love his positive things. Whenever he has to do a jab, notice what he does. But I trust that you will know that you're not disqualified, right? I mean, he, he rattles the cage a tiny bit and he says, just that's for you people who, who aren't listening. And he says, now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what's honorable, though we may seem disqualified, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Uh, I, I wrote down this thought, and I hope it will help you as it's helped me, which is time and truth travel together. Um, they will be seen together eventually. Um, and what I mean by that, I've, t I've told it to, to students who are like, man, they're, they're telling, kids are telling this about me and it's not true. And I'm like, well, guess what? Time and truth travel together. There's no way that that lie can live forever. The truth will come out. The truth will come out. And people who are wise will wait and see. And people who are not will jump on every bandwagon that comes. And this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, I... I'm not asking you to do the right thing for our sake so we look good. He said, we already look bad. Everyone already misaligns us. I'm not saying this so my reputation will be improved. He says, I'm saying this because right is right. And it will lead where you want it to go. Time and truth will travel together. You will head to the places you want to go because time will tell. And over the years, if, uh, there's another thing I've seen from the front row. It's that God is so faithful to give people flagmen before they go off the cliff. I've, just, I've been that flagman several times. I've seen those things happen. And I take it very soberly as a thought because if people are repeatedly warning me on something, it's easy for me to go, well, why don't you take care of yourself? Or who are you to say that about me? Or whatever else. But if I start hearing the same message over and over again that there's a cliff ahead and you're headed off it, well, I've had those conversations with people where I was like, hey, you know what? I just have a sense that, some no, no, brother, praise God, hallelujah, living in victory, everything's great. And a week later, that private meeting that could have avoided all kinds of public embarrassment, I'm like, ooh, wow, man. Truth is like a beach ball at a swimming pool. You can push it down, but it's coming back. It has a way of coming to the surface. And the same thing is true as a doctor or a dentist or a mechanic. If I don't want to tell them the truth, you know, the engine's making noises, so I just turn up the radio. <laughs> you, 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 I don't want to hear that clunking sound. I, I don't want to go. It, truth wins. You'll be on the side of the road. I didn't do something about it. I just covered it with the radio. If I go to the dentist, oh, I don't want to go to the dentist. I got a tooth pain. I know what he's going to tell me. He's going to tell me I got to get it filled. And it's like, well, if you don't do that, you're going to be calling him on the overnight thing, trying to figure out how to make it through the night to the next morning for the root canal that didn't have to happen, right? So this is what he's saying. We're glad. We're glad when we're weak and you're strong. I like that. that I'm plenty happy when I'm wrong and you're right. I love it. I've been in meetings where I've told people I want to be wrong. I desperately want to be wrong. Believe me, I don't want to be right on this. I want to be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. I am happy a year from now to say false alarm, sorry, I panicked and it didn't, it wasn't necessary, but I'd rather do that than sit in silence and just say, well, could have fixed it with a stitch, but we didn't. And Paul's praying for those who are criticizing him and he's not saying get them, he's saying get to them, get to them with an ounce of prevention so that you don't have to bring a pound of cure, <laughs> that they'd be mature. It's in a medical sense that he says that you would be whole. See, that's his goal. His goal is that they would be whole. Not that he would be right, but that they would be righted, 
right? And I think about this, complete. There's several ways that word was used, and I think sometimes these things are interesting because they'll break through us. We'll hear it once, one way, and not get it, but some other way. In a medical sense, it meant the setting of a broken bone. So you could say, oh, it's not broken. It's not broken. I, I'm, I'm okay. It's not broken. But if the bone is broken, it, it will, time will tell. <laughs> and it may heal, and it may have to be rebroken to be reset later. And wouldn't it have been easier to do it that way. He, it was a, a word that the uh, marine, you know, the, the sailors would use in that day when they said that you would be complete. I'm going off of that word complete. It means ready. It's like if, you know, Mike's going to go off sailing and they do a pre-boat check, right? And there's, there's water pouring into the boat. And he says, boat's all ready. <laughs> Truth will tell, right? I mean, time will tell the truth. It wasn't ready. So, oh, all ready to go. Sails are good. You know, boats sound. It's not, you know. It, Army is the most well-trained, well-equipped fighting force in history during peacetime. And then you say, time will tell. I don't know. You know, people, that's what he was saying is that I, I want you to actually be prepared, not for my visit, but for the visit of life that will come whether I do or don't. And verse 10, he says, Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord gave me for edification and not for destruction. What's he saying? He says, I do have a scalpel, but I want to use it for improvement, not destruction. You know, it's not a knife to destroy things. He says, it's for edification, it's for encouragement, it's for building up, it's for not tearing down. But sometimes you know as well as I do that you have to tear something down before you can build it up. If there is something in the way of uh, a renovation, then you have to do the demo day and then you build it back up, right? But you can't just always put something on top of something that's not there. I remember when we had a kitchen done many years ago, um, they said, your cabinets are so weak that if we put granite on it, they will collapse. Right, And we could have said, but we don't want new cabinets. They worked fine with the old warped, terrible uh, things. And it, they said, I'm telling you, if you don't fix the foundation, it will fall. So, you know, when you think about that, this is what a spiritual authority is for. It's an intelligence. It's a wisdom that is found in the scripture. And Jeremiah 1 says to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. And there's times in that where you just simply have to pull something out for something good to go in. And that's what Paul was saying. He said, maybe you think I put you down. I'm trying to pull you up. I'm trying to do anything I can to get you ready for a great visit because he knew he was just about to get there. And, you know, he says the ending is great. He says, finally, brethren, farewell. Be complete. I mean, he's like, be ready. Be complete. Be mature. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. The God of love and peace will be with you. He's basically saying, be mature. That's what complete meant. Be grown up. Be 100%. One of the marks of maturity is not having to be told the same thing over and over and over again, right? I can coach myself as sometimes as a parent, not, not flawlessly, but there's times where I don't need my mom anymore to tell me something because I tell me something, right? I did listen to them and I think myself, you know, I should go to sleep. I have to get up early tomorrow. I don't think, I don't want to get up early. I don't want to go. I'm like, Scott, be mature, be complete, right? And so again, how many times does someone have to tell me? Well, hopefully in my life, nobody has to tell me one time for many things. And that's what Paul was saying. He's saying, I, I don't want to tell you. You should tell yourself. Be of good comfort. That sounds right. The God of comfort will be there. Be of one mind. Get along with each other. Greet each other with a holy kiss. And this was a favorite memory verse back in youth group uh, for guys that are like, see, it's right there. Um, but but it actually, uh, that's right there on the cheek. And um, it's uh, it was the equivalent of a hearty handshake in those days so you know that I did always have to at least take a side for that but verse 13 and 14 it says the saints greet you the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God the communion of the Holy Spirit with be with you all so that's where this book ends with Paul on his way to Corinth saying please 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 before I get there just just Stitch it. Stitch it so we don't have to go into the surgery room as soon as I get there. You know, stitch it up. 
Sew it up with love and grace and, and, and all that. Deal with the stuff. Get that bitterness out and, and let's go on with the better stuff. Time will tell whether it worked or not. You know, did it work? Did it not? Well, here's what's cool. I think you'll like this. We studied the book of Romans and this is where I close. The book of Romans, you know where it was written from? It was written from Corinth. Paul actually did make it to Corinth. He did make it just like he said he would. And it was a lot harder for him to get there than he thought it would be. But this is pretty funny. In the end of Romans 15, this is what he says. There is no more need for me here in Corinth. I will soon be coming to Rome. So what did he do? He, he went to Corinth and he wrote the book of Romans there. How do you think he had time to do that? It must have calmed down a little, right? So he writes in Corinth. He sees that it works. He saw that time did tell and he told him one more time, and guess what? Corinth somehow got it. And he says, my job here is through. How could his job ever be through? Well, when I see Stephen or Bethany or Carissa say to their kid, how many, more how many times do I have to tell you? And they tell me, they tell that kid something I told them, I'll know, there's no more need for me here. I can go on to other things, you know, greener pastures or whatever. Because the baton has been passed, and that's exactly what happened. Time will tell. And that's why Paul cared and loved enough to give a warning, even a stern warning. But he always wrapped it with this incredible love that was like, the reason I say this is not for me. I say it for you, that you would not ever have to go through an unnecessary surgery or ever have the impossible thought that you look at it and say, I'm sorry, there's just nothing more we can do about this situation. It could have been fixed, but now it's too far past that. You go, wow, the God of the impossible can do even those. But why test him on it? <laughs> I would rather say, God, time will tell. Tell me one more time and help me intervene early. God, thank you for the fact that we can fix things the easy way so many times. Doesn't mean we won't go through some difficult things. Everybody does. But I pray that uh, whatever things we'd go through would never be the things of our own making or the things that could have been easily avoided if we had listened a little closer. And I pray that for everybody here in this room and everybody we affect. I thank you that uh, in so many ways we might think we're not getting through to somebody, uh, but in fact we are. Uh, only time will tell. Uh, the truths that have broken through. Uh, the, certainly in my life, there were times it didn't look like there was any way this was ever going to get through to me, but it did. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.